two scripture passages this morning, an Old Testament scripture passage and a New Testament scripture passage. The Old Testament scripture passage is Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 21. It can be found in your pew Bibles on page 85. Our second scripture passage is Romans 8, verse 28 through 30, and that can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1,757. Before we turn to God's word, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, enlighten us by your spirit that we may come to know your love for us in Jesus Christ through your word. Help us, Lord, to know how the gospel gets us through that these promises may be a safe hold, a strong tower for those of us who feel that we are beaten and pushed around by this world that we live in. Give us confidence. Give us faith. Grant us your grace from your word this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 21, if you're familiar with that, it's the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, and of course, it is the fact that he is sold into slavery that then he is able to save his family when there's a drought in the land. But following the death of Jacob, Joseph's brothers get worried that Joseph is going to remember the harm that they did to him, that they, they did to him, and punish him for it. So this is where we read this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their faith was, uh, the father was dead, they said, "What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him?" So they sent word to Joseph saying, "Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph." I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Now, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 30, starting the reading at verse 18. Pew Bible, page 1757. Paul speaking to the church in Rome. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Then our text today. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. 
And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Thus far, the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word, may he bless it to the hands, hearts, and minds of his people. If you live inside this massive promise, your life is more solid and stable than Mount Everest. Nothing can blow you over when you are inside the walls of Romans 8.28. Outside of Romans 8.28, all is confusion and anxiety and fear and uncertainty. Outside this promise of all-encompassing future grace, there are straw houses of drugs and alcohol and numbing TV and dozens of futile diversions. There are slat walls and tin roofs of fragile investment strategies and fleeting insurance coverage and trivial retirement plans. There are cardboard fortifications of deadbolt locks and alarm systems and anti-ballistic missiles. Outside are a thousand substitutes for Romans 8, 28. Once you walk through the door of love into the massive, unshakable structure of Romans 8, 28, everything changes. They're coming to your life's stability and depth and freedom. You simply can't be blown over anymore. The confidence that a sovereign God governs for your good, all the pain and all the pleasure that you will ever experience in an incomparable refuge and security and hope and power in your life. So says John Piper in his book, Future Grace. Our theme this morning is the comfort of the gospel is knowing that God is for us. In Christ Jesus our Lord. The comfort of the gospel is knowing that God is for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you read just a little bit after our passage this morning, you will hear the question asked If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? We have two points this morning. If we are going to know that God is for us in Christ Jesus our Lord, we have to look at his providence for us. His providence for us is described beautifully in verse 28 of our passage this morning. But if we're going to know how God is for us in Christ Jesus, we also need to know his purpose in us. And that's what verse 29 and 30 describe for us. So, his providence for us and his purpose in us. I'd like to look at that first point, his providence for us. Verse 28, many say, is the second most popular, most well-known verse in all of Scripture. The first, of course, is John 3.16. But if you were to ask someone, what is your second favorite verse, many might tell you Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. It's a good verse. It's a verse that sticks easily upon a, a nice, comforting, and uplifting greeting card. But often, this verse is tossed around like a nice, little, piffy, positive statement. And its context and its depth is not fully grasped. A lot of times people read this verse and what they think it means is that, oh, whatever bad thing happens to me in this life, oh, you know, I just broke my leg, that, that means God's got a Ferrari coming for me down the road. That's not what the Lord is saying to us here. So I'd like to take a second and look at God's providence for us in verse 28. It tells us five things. The first is that God works. We know that in all things God works. But before we get to that first point, we need to know, we need to understand why Paul the Apostle says, and we know. <laughs> 
and we know. It's easy to skip right on past that because what Paul is saying is that this is a universal Christian truth. We know. Earlier in Romans 8, he says in verse 22, that we also know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. But he also says there are things we also don't know. In verse 26, he says, we do not know what we ought to pray for. This is why, before we look at Romans 8, 28, I want all of you here this morning to understand that there may be some here this morning that don't know. That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. There may be some here today who refuse to know that because they are in the deepest, darkest time of their life. They are in the midst of great suffering. And these words come to them and they can't hear them. And my prayer is that if there's someone here this morning who does not know the great comfort of Romans 8.28, that your heart would be softened, that you would know that the comfort of the gospel is knowing that God is for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and that God's fatherly providence in our lives is something that is meant to give us comfort for those deepest, darkest moments in the midst of great suffering. So we hear God works. This is something we all need to know. The first thing that we need to know is that God is not an absent God. God is not a God who has created the world like a spinning clockwork machine and stepped away from it. And whatever it does, it does. And when the machine breaks down, it breaks down. It was a good experiment. It's over. God is a God, of course, who is over and above us, outside of us. But God is also the God who is for us by us, with us, in us. And the first statement of Romans 8.28 is the declaration that God is working in our lives. God is working in our lives. And maybe we don't see it. Maybe we can't see how he's working in our lives. But he is. Good, bad hard, easy. It's important then that we know the kind of work that God is doing in our lives. And Romans 8, 28 says, we know that in all things God works for the good. For the good. God is Good. That is the declaration of Scripture, is the self-revelation of God Himself. All good things come from Him. He is the definition. He is the last, final place, the ultimate. He is where we get any concept of goodness from. And Paul says here to the church in Rome, the way that God is working in our lives is for our good. For our good. For our good as defined and determined by God. God is the one who created us. God is the one we were created for. And I think it's safe to say that God knows what's best for us. God 
is working in our lives for our good. And there's a clarifying statement here in Romans 8, 28. It's that God is working for the good of those who love him. This is a promise for Christians. A promise for the lovers of God who love God because God first loved them. This is not a universal promise. This is not a piffy, positive, encouraging statement meant for all to feel better about their lives and their circumstances. This is for Christians. God works for our good, for the good of his people. And up to this point, it's not really all that controversial, Romans 8, 28. It's not really all that difficult to understand. God is working in our lives for our good. God is working in the lives of his people for their good. It's not until he says, and we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And there's a very interesting thing that happens here in the Greek when Paul says all things, it means all things. Pretty profound, right? God is working all things for the good. God is working all things for the good. And some of you here this morning might hear all things and you think, yeah, God is working all things that I'm doing for him. God is working all things of, in my pursuit of holiness and godliness, all things in, in, in my Christian living, in my Bible reading, in scripture reading. No, nope. he's working those things for good too, but he means all things. All things. Okay, are you saying that God is using the, 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 the sad, the difficult, the harmful, the, the, the most broken and, and sinful things that have happened to me because of what other people have done or because of being broken in this world or because of, of being in this cursed world? Are you saying that God is using those things for my good? Yes. I am saying that. That's what Paul is saying. This is why it's important for us to see Romans 8, 28 in context. Paul says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We like that stuff, right? Co-heirs with Christ we are going to be heirs with Christ and the new heavens and the new earth, inheritors of the kingdom of God, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. You see what Paul's saying here? He's saying, he's saying the Christian life is the sharing in sufferings that Christ experienced. The Christian life is the same path that Christ walked from suffering to glory, from humiliation to exaltation. But Paul's declaration about the suffering is that I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In fact, Paul describes the world itself under this subjection, under this groaning, waiting to be liberated, waiting to be free from the bondage to decay. And Paul says, we as Christians, we're like the world that we see around us. 
We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What Paul is saying, sometimes we are in the midst of such great suffering and turmoil that we, we, don't, even, we don't even have words to say. We can't even think clearly enough to figure out what exactly it is that we should be praying for. And he says, even in those moments, the Spirit, Himself intercedes with us, for us, with groans that words cannot express. What, what am I saying here? When Paul says in Romans 8, 28, that God is working for the good in all things, he's saying it to people who can't even come up with words to pray. He's saying it to people who are in the midst of great turmoil and suffering. He's saying it to the same people that he said. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death. All day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's who Romans 8.28 is for. Well, Carrie, are you saying that not only does God use the things in this world that happen to me, that cause me great harm and suffering, sickness, the death of a loved one, a car accident that injures me deeply and greatly that I suffer the rest of my life with those injuries. Carrie, are you saying not only the things that happen to me in this life as a Christian, but also the things that I do? The sinful things that I do. The choices I make that hurt the ones I love. the addictions that I spend years trying to shake, the lies that I have told. Are you telling me that God uses those things for my good? Yes. That's what all things mean. I am not saying that God is the author of sin. I am not saying that we should go on sinning as grace may, ab may abound, as Paul said that people thought he was preaching. What I am saying is that as a Christian, the choices we make and the sins that we do, God uses them for our good. What is that good? That's what we need to know. What is the good that God is working through all the things that we experience in this life? The good, the bad, the ugly. The things that happen to us and the things that we ourselves do. What is it? God works in all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. His providence for us is all-encompassing. The reason why Romans 8.28 is such a foundation, a great and strong promise to us, is that there is not a circumstance in which it does not apply. There's not a situation It does not count. It does not remind. It does not help us to recall. 
what the Lord is doing in our lives if we have been called according to his purpose. He is working all things for our good. That's his providence for us. But the working of all those things for our good comes into greater clarity when we understand his purpose in us. And that's what Romans 8, 29 through 30 continue to go on to say. What is this being a called according to his purpose? And Paul expands upon that. He says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is a great and wonderful passage, and I think the challenge in preaching it is that so often we in Reformed churches are are so theologically minded that we enjoy and appreciate expanding or uh, expositing this passage in correlation into the way that we're different than others in the Christian community. We like to go all Calvinist on this passage and That's important. I understand that. But if all we accomplish in preaching this is that you understand the perseverance of the saints or the five points of Calvinism better than I have not done my job, the point of Romans 8, 29 through 30 is to get to your heart so that you can stand firm on what God has done for you in Christ Jesus so that you can know the comfort of the gospel that God is for you. He's not against you in Christ Jesus and that if God is for you in Christ Jesus then he will get you through. He will accomplish his purpose in you and that's what this is. For those God foreknew. Some people look at this foreknew and they see it as to know before. And so their understanding of foreknowledge from this passage is that God looks down through the corridor of time and he sees all who will have faith in him of their own free will and then he chooses them based on that foreseen faith. But if that's the case, this is not a comfort for us. Because if our foreseen faith is the reason why we were chosen, then our, then our, our lack of faith, or choosing not to have faith, could be the reason why we're unchosen. No, oh, there's a really important word mentioned in correlation with this word for new. For those God for new. These are people that he foreknew. These are people that he knows. I think about the word to know. Right? We could say we know a lot about someone. We know a lot about uh, a pro athlete, we know his stats, we know the score he got in the last game, we know all the details about his career, where he first played, where he played in college, where he did all this. But do we know that pro athlete? Can we show up at his door for a Labor Day cookout and say, hey, I know you? No. No. That's why we need to see this word for new in the context of the word yada, to know, from the Hebrew scriptures. To know is an expression of intimacy, of closeness. We're told that Adam knew Eve and conceived. We're also told that God said to Israel, 
you, only of all the tribes of the world, have I known. And God is not saying in that moment, I looked down through the quarters of time and I saw that Israel would choose me and therefore I chose them and that's why only Israel do I know. He knows of all the tribes in the world, all the peoples in the world. He knows Israel. For those God foreknew, for those God foreloved. That's why we read in Ephesians 1, that great passage, the mystery of the gospel. The words that Paul proclaims to the church in Ephesus, in love he predestined. In love he predestined us. If there's any free act of love not based upon anything in a person, it is the predestining love of God that He would know us before we were ever born, before we had ever done anything right or wrong, knowing all the sin we would commit still he would send his son to die on the cross and to redeem us. But what about this predestining? There's a lot that could be said about predestined, but I want to focus on two things, the two things that Paul mentions in verse 29. The God predestined us to a purpose. He predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And this is important for us to understand because when we think about the way that God is working all things for our good, when we think about the way that God is working all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, this is the ultimate good. Conformity to Jesus Christ. So you ask yourself, how does suffering in this life do me good, God? And the answer to that question is it conforms you to the suffering Savior. And you ask yourself, God, how can the, the sins that I personally commit and the, and the pain that I cause other people do me good? And God says, I am using the conviction of that sin, the consequences of that sin, the discipline of that sin to conform you to the image of my Son, Jesus Christ. We were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What does it mean that Christ would be the firstborn among many brothers? What it means is that Christ is the heir proper to the kingdom of God. That in his living, suffering, dying And in his resurrection, he was given a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee would bow, every tongue confess. That he was given the kingdom. But that we are also co-heirs with him. The book of Hebrews tells us that we call Christ brother. Brother. That we have been adopted into the family of God, and that our being conformed to the image of Christ in this life, and then ultimately to be perfectly conformed to the likeness of His Son, is so that Christ could be in that position of honor, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so when we look at Revelation and it tells us that the redeemed are all there gathered with white robes, the people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and we are worshiping the one who sits on the throne and the lamb 
Not only is that a glorious picture of the worship and the glory and the honor that God and the Lamb that was slain deserve, but it's also a family gathering. A family reunion. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. That's his purpose in us. And how do we know that that will be accomplished? Is it for us to work harder, to exert ourselves, to put everything that we possibly can into it, to be conforming ourselves as much as we possibly can? He continues. Verse 30, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Many call this the golden chain of redemption. It's an unbreakable link by link describing for us the salvation that we've received in Jesus Christ. Describing for us the comfort of the gospel in knowing that God is for us in Christ Jesus. That the gospel will get us through. Not only has God foreloved us, not only has he predestined us before creation to be conformed to the image of his son, that we would be adopted into his family, that, they were, that Christ would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, but that foreordination comes into time and history in the effectual call of the gospel. That each and every one of us would hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That you don't have to be burdened by your sins anymore. That Christ has suffered and died to, to take away your sin and to give you his righteousness. that the Holy Spirit would work with the preaching of the gospel, that we may turn and believe and have faith, and by that faith be justified, be declared righteous before God, to be as if we never had ever sinned. And that justification, it completes itself in the final stage of our Our destinies. When I titled the sermon, How the Gospel Gets Us Through, the through, it's not only this life, it's not only the suffering that we experience, the hardships, it's not only the choices that we make that hurt ourselves and hurt others. It's that ultimate point. The point of glorification, the point where Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Many often say that Paul in this golden chain of redemption skips past sanctification, justified, those he justified, he also glorified. Besides the fact that in verse 29, being predestined to be conformed to the image, the likeness of the Son, is an explanation of sanctification. All glorification is, is the completion of sanctification. And the beauty in this promise is that Paul says all these words as if they have already happened. He speaks to us who are living today, who by faith in Jesus Christ have been justified, who are being still conformed to the likeness of his son and sanctification, and who have not yet experienced glorification, the redemption of our bodies. But Paul comes to you and he says it from God's perspective. 
And he says from God's perspective, it's as good as done. It's as good as done. He doesn't say, you're being glorified. He says, those he justified, he also glorified. My question in closing is this. Do you feel shaken these days? Do you watch the news and your anxiety level goes like this? Are you watching what's happening in our streets and the violence that's going on around us and the miscommunication and mistruth and, and all the lies that are being spread? And you feel like you're being tossed back and forth. Are you standing in the unshakable promise of a sovereign God? Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The comfort of the gospel is knowing that God is for us in Christ Jesus our Lord and whatever may happen to us, whatever we may do in this life, that cannot be taken from us and it will be completed. And we will, on that future day, with our bodies redeemed, worship God for all eternity and worship the Lamb that was slain for us. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you that you have brought us to faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that the work you began in us, you will bring to completion. We thank you that all the things that we experience in this life are being used by you to conform us to the likeness of your Son, that we may suffer as he suffered, but we may look forward to the glory that will be revealed in us. That's not worth comparing what we currently experience. We pray, Lord, that in this time, in this season of, of unrest, that we would be anchored in the gospel, anchored in the promise that you are for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we would know that the gospel gets us through. So in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You stand and sing with me. Celebration Hymnal 635 in the garden. It will be on the screen.